There have been photographs. It's been recorded on videotapes. So, there's no doubt that there's something going on up there. Professor Arling Petterstrand, during an interview about the Hestalen light phenomena. This is the Blue Hour. Welcome to the Blue Hour, a weekly podcast on the strange, inexplainable, and curious tales of Europe. I'm your host, Equinox, bringing to you a mix of long-lost stories and urban legends. Please be aware that the following episode includes speculation and storytelling surrounding accounts of real-life events and people. Here at the Blue Hour, I try to be as factual as possible when it comes to the information presented, but the aim of this podcast is to entertain extraordinary and out-of-this-world possibilities, and, most importantly, to tell a good story. So gather round and settle in, because the stories you'll hear in this episode are out of this world. The valley known as Hestalen lies to the southeast of Trondheim, in central Norway. The valley is named after the Hesia River that runs through it, and with only a couple hundred of inhabitants, the area is a charming and quaint example of rural Norway. At about only 15 kilometers long, the valley is home to a strange light phenomenon that dates back to at least the 1930s. So first off, I'm going to talk about what the actual lights that have been seen look like. One thing that I find interesting is that in many photos and stories that people have of this phenomena, they often describe that the lights look very different. They're most commonly yellow, white, or red, appearing both above and below the horizon. They can also appear as blue or white flashes of light, but this is less common. Sometimes they're very large and bright, and other times smaller and dimmer. There are reliable sightings of the light moving in very different ways as well. Zooming through the sky at high speeds, over and through the valley for just a few seconds, hovering in the same place, bouncing around the sky, as well as just slowly moving around above. Some sightings even say that people have seen the light seeming to descend down onto the earth. The fastest speed ever recorded for the light was up to 30 kilometers an hour. The lights have been seen to appear both individually as well as in clusters, and sometimes they even seem to make strange formations in the sky, both high in the atmosphere and just above houses. One point to note is that they often seem to appear near the mountains of the valley, but that could just be the fact that the mountain backdrop makes them easier to see. Three main categories have been created for the Hestalen lights. The first is rapid sparkles, which are lights that appear for a short time and are often difficult to see. More often than not, 
These lights are, as the name would suggest, sparkling or blinking, either rapidly or slowly. The second category is large phenomena that hover and fly around, sometimes for hours. The third category is clusters. These have been shown to create formations in the sky and there's usually more than one or two of them at a time. There are also many other types of lights that have been seen, and documented. However, these don't appear as regularly as these three main categories. Because such different looking lights have been captured, recorded and photographed over the years, it makes it difficult to find an explanation for what, exactly, is causing or creating these lights? In the 2009 documentary, The Portal, Professor Björn Gittler Hauger at the University of Östfold describes the light as very intense, up to a megawatt, and the lights last for a long time. But where in the world, he wonders, is the power coming from? Where are the fuel tanks that manage to power these lights, some of which are as big as a house? The most active period for the phenomena was during the mid-80s, when there were up to 20 sightings per week. This created a sort of tourist and ufologist rush in the area, and many came out and camped in the valley to get a good look at the lights and to try and photograph them, which was difficult at the time with the photography equipment available, considering that the lights were often far away and in motion. In the same documentary, photojournalist Arne Wist tells of when a group of 30 to 40 people watched as a long, oval-shaped light descended from the sky, out from behind the clouds, almost as if it were landing. It stopped right in front of them, and rotated slowly, and then seemed to drift slowly down the valley and the mountainside. As it reached the top of the mountain, it turned vertically, where it was observed that there was an object inside the light, the silhouette of a bullet-shaped object. Now to me, this doesn't sound like any sort of natural light. And the way that he describes the movement, it's almost as if he seems to think that it had some sort of sentience and awareness of its movement, perhaps like some sort of piloted craft. One story, which is quite short and simple, but that I really find interesting, is told by Hjertel Fordle, a local resident of Hestalen. He says that it was 1984, and he and some others were playing in a barn. He doesn't mention it, but I believe that this happened to him in his childhood. He says that they got the feeling that there was something over them, and they looked outside and up into the sky and saw a twinkling light. It was bluish-green, and it hovered over them for about ten seconds before taking off at a high speed over the mountain. He says he didn't feel scared, but was in fact lucky to have seen it up close. Up until then, he had only seen the light from far away. The municipal government of Holtolem built an automated observation station for the Hestalen light phenomena in 1998. A large blue container on top of a hill is known as Hestalen Automatic Measurement Station, or simply Hestalen AMS. 
The station has three TV cameras and a magnetometer, a device used to record changes in the direction and strength of magnetic fields. A little snippet of information that I found that really creeped me out was that even when there's no light in the sky sighted, the equipment at the observatory picks up movement. Even in the absence of light, there's without a doubt something up there. They get very strong readings of whatever it is moving around the sky. There are so many eyewitnesses to this phenomena that we can be sure that there's something happening out there. The explanation for which no one is truly sure of. At least, not yet. There are, however, many theories. And as you know, here at the Blue Hour, you and I are definitely willing to entertain some of the stranger ones. Now, I think it's pretty evident that whatever this phenomena is, it can't be put down simply to planes, either military or commercial. At least, not terrestrial ones. The lights are always described as silent, and there's an absence of any sort of engine sounds when they're sighted. Unless, of course, there's some sort of super high-tech craft that we don't know about, that has existed at least since the 1930s. There are other theories that say the lights are simply the reflections of the lights from a nearby train track. However, a lot of the encounters describe things that wouldn't really be possible if this was the case. Now, I know what many of you may be thinking, and we're all probably thinking it. Aliens. Lights in the sky. Some of which resemble strange crafts or objects, and exhibit what could be perceived as flight patterns. When researchers started to talk to the locals, they found that many of them had stories of seeing not just lights in the sky. Bjarne Lillevold, a farmer and local in Hestalen, claims to have 68 separate encounters or sightings, all of which he has written down from over the years. Strange shapes and objects in the sky, some high, others low, all silent, and only some of them accompanied by light. He recounts one sighting from June 11, 2006, on a very hot and clear day. A strange cylinder-shaped object came over the mountain in broad daylight. However, the sunlight did not shine on or reflect off of the south side of the object as it should have. Instead, the light came from the north side, seeming to pass through whatever the object was. There are countless stories from the locals of having seen similar things to this, not just, it seems, to be a light phenomenon after all. However, the validity of these stories will always be questionable, as with any other anecdote. A strange factor is that many of the objects described by locals in their stories have many similar features, often described as cigar, bullet-shaped, or cylindrical, sometimes with a pointed front and lights on what we would assume to be the front of the craft. When stories such as this started to come out of Hestalin, the people that lived there were ridiculed and made fun of others. One lady mentions that she couldn't even drive into town to buy groceries 
without getting scoffed at. There was a great stigma attached to anyone who spoke about seeing such things. It was because of this that the phenomena was first recorded and studied by a group of UFO enthusiasts with help from the University of Bergen, using military-grade equipment. And, in their first winter, they made 53 observations within one month, and it was then that people began to take this phenomena seriously. During one test, they pointed a laser towards one of the blinking lights when it showed up and eight of the nine times that they tested it, the blinking pattern of the light changed. Could this be a coincidence? Or perhaps some method of communication? That we still don't know. A very strange documented story from nearby Hestalen is told by a moose hunter it isn't an encounter with any lights, but it is still quite strange. He was walking through a marsh early in the morning when he came upon a piece of ground that had been seemingly cut away with immense precision. A large piece of the top of the ground lay a few meters away from this strange hole. The hole was about 40 centimeters deep, and the sides and bottom of it were straight, perfect lines. Stranger still, there was no sign of disturbance, footprints, machine tracks, or any signs of digging. Just a perfect, clean-cut slab taken out of the ground and placed a few meters away from the hole that it left. Upon closer inspection, it was so precisely cut that the tree and plant roots in the slab that was removed were cut cleanly and straight across, as if with a sharpened razor. Not only that, but that amount of wet marshland would probably have weighed around 2,000 kilograms, or two tons. And to top it all off, the site that he found this was a few hours' walk from any sort of civilization. After some time, they found that this had happened further north in Norway two years previous. The exact same size piece of ground removed and placed a few meters nearby the hole. All of this was documented and photographed, which can be seen to this day. And, to this day, there is still no explanation. There are countless stories, anecdotal of course, that seem to support the extraterrestrial theory. And if that's something that you're interested in, I recommend you check out the documentary The Portal, the Hestalen Light Phenomenon, from 2009. When I watched it, I kind of realized it was a bit biased towards the extraterrestrial theory, and some of the stories in there are a bit far-fetched, but nonetheless, it was really entertaining to watch. You should be able to find it easily on the internet, I believe it's on YouTube, although I won't link it to avoid any copyright problems. But if these lights are some sort of extraterrestrial activity, it makes me wonder, what's so special about Hestalen, a valley in rural Norway? And what would such beings, evidently with quite advanced technology in comparison to us, be doing there? Another theory about the lights, which is a little bit out there, goes hand in hand with the extraterrestrial theory, and different people have theorized different things. 
That theory is that Hestalin, or the sky around Hestalin, is home to a number of portals. It's unsure whether these portals could be to another world or dimension, or something else that we don't quite understand. This theory came about due to the fact that the light seemed to appear, reappear in other locations, and then disappear again without a trace. Now, I'm not sure about this theory, but, after all, I do believe that anything is possible. Now, as a lover of old folklore myself, one thing that I thought of when I heard about the Hestalin lights was the old European tale of the Will of the Wisp. Different variants of this legend can be found all across Europe. In Norway, it is known by a few different names, Lykdemann, which translates to the light man, Vetelis, which means white light, as in a supernatural white or spirit, not the colour white, or Alvelis, meaning elf lights. Much like in the rest of Europe, these lights are said to show up around marshes and water. According to Norwegian legend, the lights are supernatural creatures themselves, or created by supernatural creatures living nearby. And they're said to lead people away to drown or disappear, never to be seen again. Although this legend isn't exactly what people are seeing in Hestalin, I think that there's enough similarities that it's worth mentioning. And who's to say that some phenomena like what we're seeing in Hestalin didn't influence this legend throughout time? One of the more scientific theories, although I don't like to use the term scientific because, in actuality, if you can prove anything to be true, then it's scientific. For example, if you prove the existence of aliens, then that's science. Anyway. One theory theorizes that the lights are caused by a giant natural battery created by the valley. On one side of the valley, the rocks are rich in zinc and iron, and the other side of the river that runs through the valley is rich in copper. It's believed that if the water of the river that runs through the valley was high enough in sulfur, then this could work together to create a large natural battery, which could create lights in the sky, theoretically, if enough charge built up. Many have also looked into the possibility that the lights could be ball lightning, or a different form of the northern lights that we haven't seen in other places. But to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense, because the lights have been reported to look so different to what ball lightning or the northern lights actually look like, not to mention that they've also been spotted below the horizon. There are plenty of other more scientific theories for the lights, but many of them are far too complicated for me, and I think they're nowhere near as entertaining as the stranger theories. What we do know is that there's a team and a station observing the strange lights in the sky in Hestalin, studying it and trying to work out what exactly it is. But one thing we maybe haven't thought of is whether or not the lights are observing us too. I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting me and my content, if you enjoy this podcast, you should head over and check out my page, and consider becoming a patron. Every little bit counts and helps me in making more content on a more regular basis. And if you know someone that loves strange tales just as much as you and I do, then please share the Blue Hour with them, and help get the word out about the podcast. Stay tuned for next week's episode where we look into the tale of a phantom that terrorised the streets of Victorian London. I'm Equinox, and you've been listening to The Blue Hour.